in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Throw your hands up. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much that we've been called into the kingdom of God, that we are your earthly representatives. We represent your health, your wealth, your goodness, your grace, your kindness. Father, we represent you here in the earth. And thank you, Lord, for your word. We couldn't do it without you. We need your word. We need your guidance. And thank you today as we come before you to receive your word. We declare today that we are the healed. We're the redeemed. We're the blessed coming and going. We're the blessed in the city. You are the blessed everywhere you go and everything you set your hands to do prospers and flourishes because you're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And you reign in life through the abundance of grace and the gift of of righteousness amen 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 thank you for joining today today i want to continue on we've been talking about the new covenant we've been talking about the terms of the new covenant and today y'all the whole new covenant is about the grace of god the grace of god god is such a loving god that he wants everyone to receive his grace in abundance God is more in love with the world than we're in love with ourselves. He's in love with the church. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God showed his love towards mankind through his grace. So today I want to talk to you about this because the whole new covenant, y'all have heard me say it before, the whole New Testament, the new covenant is the old revealed. The new, the, the old is the new concealed the two go hand in hand hand all the stories in the old testament reveal truths of the new covenant of grace and and all the all paul explains these stories there's chapter after chapter in the new testament in hebrews and in galatians that explain that that talk about abraham and sarah and hagar and how their types and shadows of the new covenant of grace and today i want to just begin to look at that because the, as we delve into further and further into understanding how to walk in the new covenant of grace how to walk in this it's really a contractual agreement that god has made with with mankind we need to understand it and so we want to just understand how do we receive this grace well first of all turn on over in your bible turn over in your bible to romans chapter 5 and verse 17 i gotta say romans chapter 5 may be one of my favorite chapters it is definitely one of my favorite chapters right there in the top maybe be in the maybe in the top five chapters in the bible for me this is one of them romans chapter 5 romans i like to call it the magna carta of the gospel it's where paul really explains the truths of the gospel he opens up saying i'm not ashamed of the gospel of christ and he explains that it is the power of God to salvation to everyone that believes. And he explains that the power of the power of the gospel is in this gift of righteousness. And God, under the, the new covenant, and the main reason that, that God implemented the new covenant and said the old covenant is old now, is because he wants this relationship with us. Christianity is about this genuine relationship this closeness this oneness that we this marriage essentially that we get to have with God as his representatives here in the earth and that relationship I want to show it to you today is a matter of knowing his promises for you and I walking in them claiming them by faith declaring them walking in them and it will cause you and I as believers regardless of what circumstances are going on in the world to reign in life like kings and that's what i want to begin to look at today so let's take a look at it turn over in your bible turn over in your bible to romans chapter 5 and let's look at verse 17 romans chapter 5 very familiar passage of scripture if you've been around destiny for any period of time look what it says here romans chapter 5 verse 17 for if by one man's offense death reigned through the one you know who that's talking about right there for if by one man's offense death reigned through through the one it's talking about adam through adam's offense his transgression through his one offense you know what offense is talking about in the garden of eden 
them eating the fruit which God, the forbidden fruit which God told them not to eat. And he said, in the day that you eat of that fruit, you should surely die. Now, he didn't physically die that day, but he died spiritually. He died spiritually that day. It was a separation of mankind and God. Why, you, why do we say mankind and, and not just Adam? Because Adam was the head of mankind. He was the, every human being came from Adam, ultimately. And now that Adam had sinned and was essentially an alive dead man, rain, death reigned through him, every single person after him was born into death. And so look what it says, for if by one man's offense, death reigned. That word reign there is basilica. Basilica, and it means to reign and have rulership like a king. That same word in the Old Testament is kingdom, oftentimes kingdom. It's, it's this rulership, it's this reigning in life. So by one man's offense, death had rulership and reign over us through one man's offense. That one man is Adam. And that's the bad part of the verse, but look at the b good part of the verse, the second half of it. It says, much more those who receive. Much more what? Much more than the gravity, the impact of Adam's offense causing death to reign. And death reigns means that every one of us one of every single human being is born into sin. Every one of us will be faced with sickness, with death, with lack at some point in our life because, we're all, because of Adam's transgression, because of Adam's sin. So think about that. For by one man's offense, death, sickness, disease, that's why all of us will have a funeral if Jesus doesn't return and doesn't come right back in the next hundred years. Every one of us alive now will not be alive. Because of Adam's offense. Listen to this second part. Much more than that. Much more than that death reigning. Those who receive just two things. Those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. Look at the last part. Will reign in life through one Jesus Christ. This passage is so powerful. This passage is really had a great impact on my life because it's of what it says. We, we often talk about the power of sin, the power of death, the law of sin and death, and how powerful it is. Think about the gravity of it. That's why all of us age. That's why all of us are faced with sickness. That's why there's COVID-19 in the earth. That's why there's murder. That's why there's death. That's why, because of Adam's offense. Much more than that. Bigger than that, then, those who just receive. Two things abundance of grace that means grace and abundance and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through one jesus Christ. reign in life what does that mean everything that was done through adam's offense you and i as believers everyone who receives those two things abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness can reign over those now it's so important that we understand that because in, a, in the world that we live in today hopefully you see this that we live in a fallen earth where it is an antichrist culture. And we, you and I as believers, have got to learn how to stand against sickness. We've got to learn to stand against disease. Come on, we've got to learn to stand in the word of God and believe God for his promises and reign over sickness, over death, over lack, over poverty. That's what the whole new covenant is about, us reigning in life and sharing this good news of the gospel with others so that others can walk in it as well. Praise the Lord. So let's give definition real quick. Let's give definition to grace. Grace, because that's what the whole new covenant is. The whole new covenant is about God's love for mankind Man, God isn't so in love with mankind that he wants to have a relationship with mankind through Jesus Christ. How are you doing, Pastor? Wants to have a relationship with mankind, and in order to do that, he had to remove the issue that was separating us from God. And the issue that was separating us was Adam's transgression, his sin. And so, so again, this is why that passage is so important. What Adam did in separating us from God through sin, through death, through his transgression, Jesus reversed that curse at the cross. He undid, Jesus, Jesus undid by his broken body and shed blood everything that's, that Adam did, that Satan did through Adam in his transgression. It's a much greater thing. And in fact, in that same chapter of Romans chapter 5, 
Five times it says, much more, much more, much more. Much more than what Adam did in his transgression, which brought sin and death and poverty and lack. Much more what Jesus did at the cross to bring health, to bring peace, to bring provision, to bring wealth. Jesus undid, he reversed that curse that Adam brought through his broken body and shed blood at the cross. That's what the whole gospel is about. So that you and I as believers become this salt and light. We become this extension of the kingdom of God to live in the earth as believers that stand on the promises of God, that walk in all the covenant that God has made for us. That's what the new covenant is. It's, it's God's expression now of his goodness through us. Christ living in, in us, the hope of glory now. We are the Christians. We are the ones. And that's why we cannot bow down to this culture. We cannot. Many believers today, I venture to say, and, and, and according to the scriptures, the scriptures in Matthew 24, in, the, in Matthew 24, when they asked Jesus about the last days, he talked about a day would come when the very elect would be deceived. And unfortunately today, unfortunately today, what we see in our culture, we see in our culture and in our world today, we see many believers more discipled by the world and the culture than the word in Christ. They're more connected to the news on television than they are the good news of the scriptures. And therefore, they're subject to the same, the same demise, the same sickness, the same, the same lack, the same divorce, the same, the same corruption and the same destruction of the world. And that's why it's so important that we understand what God has provided and how to walk in it in the new covenant. Praise the Lord. Amen. So what is this covenant of grace? What is grace? We've been talking about it for several weeks. But grace, I love giving it this definition, this acronym. It's an easy way to remember what grace really is. Grace, G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. We get the righteousness of God. We get God's very own righteousness, not our righteousness. We get the righteousness of God. Why? Because Christ became sin. We get God's healing and health. We get his health. By his stripes, you were healed. In other words, healing at Christ's expense. That's grace. Every single thing that God provided is, is grace. He brought it to us by Jesus. Definition of grace. Grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace is God's blessing, healing, delivering, and prospering you, not because of you, not because of me, but because of Jesus. God prospering us because of Jesus. And this is the whole purpose of the new covenant, that God could see us in Christ. When the Bible describes you and I in the New Testament, and all the New Testament, it describes us as in Him, in Christ. Beloved, the beloved in Him. We're in Him. We're in Him. Why? Because now God sees us as He sees Him. He sees us. He's now, we're in Christ. We're Christians. And what faith is really all about is regaining the right identity about who you are. Most poverty problems aren't really a poverty problem. They're an identity problem. It's seeing ourselves the wrong way. It's seeing ourselves as we are in the flesh and not as we are in the spirit. And when the Bible talks about walk in the spirit and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh, that's exactly what it's talking about. It's talking about walking according to what the scriptures say about us versus what we may see, sense, taste, smell, and see. According, not according to our senses. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, for we walk by faith and not by sight. And simply what it means is walking by who we are in Christ, gaining this new identity. So grace is God's unearned, unmerited, and undeserved favor towards you and I simply because of Jesus' finished work at the cross. When Jesus hung on the cross, he said, it is finished. And that's where we get that term, finished work. He finished the work for, all, for the removal and annihilation of all the judgment of sin against you and I. He took on that judgment himself. He was punished for our sin and iniquity. The chastisement needful to obtain peace. The punishment needful to obtain peace for us was upon him and with the stripes that wounded him we are healed so you get it grace is all of God's blessing and goodness 
on you and I at his expense. He paid for your righteousness by receiving your sin. It's not that sin didn't get judged. Your sin has been judged, but not in you. It was judged in him. Are y'all getting it? That's what, that's what this new covenant of grace is all about, and that's why we're so in love with Jesus. Now, over the next several weeks, I'm going to be talking more about the new covenant, but I'm going to be teaching it from some of the stories of the Old Testament, of the Old Covenant. And every detail in the Old Testament are truths, they're hidden truths about the new covenant. In other words, what I mean is that the old, the old covenant is the new concealed. The new covenant is the old revealed. The Old Testament, re the Old Testament reveals many of the details of the new covenant truths. Let me show you what I'm talking about. It's called typology. They're pictures. All of the stories that deal with the children of Israel, the time frames, even the names of the places, the people, the details that are in the scripture, it's much more than just meets the eye. There are truths about the details of the new covenant of grace that you and I have the honor and privilege of walking in. For example, let's first look at this. Let's look at who Jesus is. Turn over in your Bible to, first, uh, to John, the Gospel of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the fourth Gospel. John chapter 1, and look at the beginning, uh, verse 1 through 4. Y'all know it. Verse 1 through 4, then we're going to look at verse 14, because I want to show you that grace, Jesus is grace personified. Jesus is grace personified. Y'all know these first passages of John chapter 1. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Isn't that an interesting passage? God and his word are synonymous. Christianity without the word is simply empty religion. Jesus said this in John chapter 8, verse 31 and 32. He said, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth will do what? The truth will make you free. The truth doesn't, when you know the truth, it doesn't give you an option of freedom. If you're in bondage in any area, it's merely an indication that the truth hasn't been shown, hasn't been revealed in that area of life. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in, He was in the beginning with God. Who was in the beginning with God? The Word was. Watch this, verse 3. All things were made through Him. Through Him who? The Word. Everything God made with His Word. So vitally important that we understand that. And, so, and it, it bears out the truth that you and I as believers must know and be connected to this word. Jesus, the word, God and the word are one and the same. They're inseparable. They're synonymous. All things were made through the word. And without the word or him, nothing was made that was made. And you as a believer, you and I as a believer, without the word, we don't get the healing. We don't get the abundance. We don't get the favor. It takes the word. If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth, the word, will make you free. The Bible says in Psalm 107, verse 20, he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Psalm 107, verse 20. The word must be a part, a vital part of your life. Not just something you know in your head, but it's got to be something that you live by. It is your truth. It's what you live by. The truth, God's truth, his word, is the absolute standard whereby all reality is measured. All reality as a believer, your reality should be measured by his truth. By his truth. His truth says by his stripes you were healed. So if you get a do negative doctor's report that says, oh, you're going to die, you're going to die in six months, we're not going to deny that fact, but we're going to change that fact with this standard of the truth. And the truth will change that sickness. The truth will change that poverty. The truth will change it. But only if you know it and stand on it in faith. Verse 3, it says, all things were made. Yeah, verse 4. In him, in the word, was life. And the life was the light of men. Jerk down to verse 14, I believe. Yes. And the word became flesh, in verse 14, and dwelt among us. And look at this. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten, of the Father. Look what he's full of. Jesus is full of what? Grace and truth. Jesus is full of grace and truth. Jump to verse 16, I believe, and I think you're going to put it in the Amplified. Yes, yes, I love this in the Amplified Bible. Look what it says. For out of his fullness, out of whose fullness? Jesus' fullness, out of his abundance, we have all. 
when you receive Jesus, you receive all he has. Watch what it says. For out of his fullness we have all received. All had a share and we were all supplied with one grace after another, spiritual blessing upon spiritual blessing, and even favor upon favor and gift heaped upon gift. When you and I receive Jesus, we receive access to all of his grace. Everything that he has is right now on the inside of your spirit. When you get born again, you received the spirit of Christ and you received his grace. You received his right. Hey, all these commands. Then these things will happen to you. Bless show you be in the city. Bless show you be in the country, etc., etc., etc. But if you read verse 15 all the way down to verse 68, it says, but if you do not keep all these commandments and all these statutes, if you read it in every translation, it says inwardly and outwardly. If you don't perfectly keep every commandment, cursed are you in the city, cursed are you in the country, cursed are you everywhere you go. It lists all these diseases. Are y'all listening to me? The old covenant was based on you and I perfectly keeping the commandments. What's better? God blessing you based on your performance or God blessing you based on Jesus' performance? That's an easy question, isn't it? It's, base, it's better. And so that's what he's saying. The old, system, uh, the old system under the law of Moses was only a shadow, a dim preview of the, look how it describes it, the good things to come. You and I live in that time right now of the good things to come. And we can allow whatever's going on in the world to, to dim this from us, to rob us. It doesn't matter what's going on in the world. We can still stand on this covenant, stand on this promise, and walk in the good things that God has for us. Look what he says. Not the good things themselves. The sacrifices under that system were repeated again and again. You remember? The, the priest, uh, the high priest could only go into the, into the uh, holy of holies, the, the, whole, the most holy place. Behind the veil, he could only go in there once a year on the Day of Atonement. And, of course, they had to tie a rope to his foot, and he had bells and tassels on the bottom of his, his garment that would ring so they could hear. If he, he could drop dead. He could, you could drop dead going to church under the Old Covenant. Not anybody could just roll up on the presence of God. And, and when Jesus hung on the cross, the Bible says that that whole veil rent and tore in two, signifying and indicating that now everyone can have access Jesus we all God doesn't turn away anyone who comes to him wanting his salvation God doesn't turn away anyone wanting his healing his provision now there used to be a veil that only one person could go in the high priest are you with me and he could only go in once a year and he had to go in with blood for himself why because he was imperfect and go in with blood for the people of Israel once a year are y'all with me and then every any time a, uh, a person would sin according to the Levitical law they'd have to bring a lamb without spot or wrinkle to be sacrificed by the priest and they would offer blood continually continually that's what that's talking about the sacrifices under the old system were repeated again and again year after year but they were never able to provide perfect cleansing for those who came to worship y'all get the comparison and contrast the old covenant blood of goats and lambs could provide perfect cleansing but the blood of Jesus did you and I are perfect in God's eyes not based on you or your performance but based on his blood his sacrifice look at the next one for me next verse two if you can't there yeah there thank you if they could have provided perfect cleansing the sacrifices would have stopped in other words, if the blood of, lamb, of goats and lambs could have provided perfect cleansing, one, one sacrifice would have covered it for everybody, right? The sacrifices would have stopped for the worshipers would have been purified once for all time and their feelings of guilt would have disappeared. Are y'all listening? Look at verse 3. But instead, those sacrifices actually reminded them of their sins year after year because the high priest had to go in once a year on the Day of Atonement and offer blood for the sins of the people. They were reminded that they had sins that needed to be forgiven. And what it's showing us is in contrast to the new covenant that Jesus went in once and for all, for all times, for all human beings. People don't go to hell for their sins they go to hell for one sin and one sin only, according to John chapter 16, and that is for the sin of not receiving the sacrifice that has been made for all mankind's sins. Are y'all listening to me? He said, but in uh, verse 4, for it is not possible for the blood of bulls, uh, for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Under the old covenant, the type and shadow, it covered sins. It covered their sins. Our sins have been completely 
taken away. Come on, somebody. Isn't that good news right there? Look at the next one. That is why when Christ came into the world, he said to God, I love this. I love this conversation. Right here in, in, in Hebrews chapter 10, we get a dialogue that, that the Father God had with Jesus regarding him coming to earth and becoming the sacrifice for our sins. Look at the conversation. It's right here. We get a peek into their conversation right here in Hebrews chapter 10. Look at verse 5. That is why when Christ came into the world, he said to God, you did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings. Look at that. But you have given me a body to offer. You are not pleased with burnt offerings or other offerings for sin. Look at verse 7, last one. Then I said, Jesus said, Look, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written about me in the Scriptures. And this is what I want you to see. The whole Bible, the Scriptures all the sacrifices, all the details of the tabernacle, all the details that are in the Old Testament are all about Jesus. To walk in the blessing of the new covenant, we've simply got to understand and know him. That's why it gives us these details of the, highly, the high priest garments. If you remember, there's all kinds of details in the Old Testament. It describes, I mean, it goes into great detail. Think about this. Just think about this just for a second. And I know if you're, if you're like me and you love to understand these truths so you can walk in the blessing that God has for us. Think about this. The high, there's one chapter in the entire Bible, one chapter dedicated to the creation of the entire universe. One chapter. One whole chapter spent on what God did to create the entire universe. The sun, the moon, the stars, mankind, plants, etc., etc. One chapter. There's over 30 chapters just in, in Exodus, in Exodus and Leviticus, and just in Deuteronomy, just about the tabernacle, the high priest garments, the details. Tells about the how the the the, the jewels, the 12 jewels on the garments. I mean, it takes chapter. There's a chapter just dedicated to the high priest garments. One whole chapter about the creation of the universe. One whole chapter in Exodus, two chapters actually talking about the high priest garments. Why? Because God is more interested in redemption than creation. It costs more for redemption than creation. Creation costs God words. Redemption costs God blood, his own blood, the blood of his son. There's more, the way you know and understand God way you know him the way you will walk out healing the way you will walk out abundance is knowing him through redemption knowing the price that he paid for you and i to walk in an abundance of his grace and the gift of righteousness that's why we need to understand the new covenant and that's why we take time to get the wisdom of god and understand these truths so we can walk in all the great things how's my time here let me share with you just some some quick things and and maybe over these next weeks we'll we'll be able to get into some of the details of this but the details of the old testament are pictures of new covenant truths the details in the Old Testament, like the killing of the Passover lamb. You remember this? The killing of the lamb and eating his flesh and putting his blood over the door uh, delivered them from Egyptian bondage. Think about that just a second. Just think about that. There's chapters in Exodus dedicated to this, dedicated details about go get a lamb, keep it in your house for so many days. You, you get a, a, a lamb without spot or blemish a, a young lamb get it bring it in your household for so many days details about this why so you fall in love with the lamb then they would kill the lamb can you imagine your kids if you took your puppy and killed him and took the blood and put it over your doorpost and then took the, the the lamb and roasted it the bible gives details about how to roast it on the fire and then he told him to eat it all and don't leave anything why so many details about that? Because there are details about Jesus. Jesus said it. My broken body and my blood, that's, that's the new covenant. The whole new covenant, isn't it? So again, in these Old Testament chapters, about that, just about that, those details explain promises. Remember what he said? Eat all of the lamb. Don't leave anything. If you've got leftovers, burn it, he says. In other words, what he's saying, what I've provided for you in my broken body, don't let any of it go to waste. 
use all of it. So every detail in the Old Testament. And remember what that did. When they put the, the blood of the lamb over their doorposts and over their lentils. You remember? The death angel that was going, going over and killing the firstborn in every household. Did he look in the household and ask a bunch of questions? No, all he did was look for the blood of the lamb. The blood of the lamb was what gave them redemption. Again, God doesn't go, go into their house and start asking, well, are you and your wife fussing? Or is anybody in sin in here? Is anybody doing anything wrong? No, no, no. All he wanted to look for was the blood. Again, showing us the power that's in this righteousness, showing us the power that's in the blood of Jesus. Again, so many details. He told him to eat the, eat the lamb with your shoes strapped on. Eat it with your staff in your hand. In other words, when you get the lamb, when you understand the benefits of eating the lamb, now your deliverance is coming. Remember, he told them, get your shoes on. You're getting ready to leave. And remember, after they ate the lamb, that's what delivered them. The Bible says when they left Egypt, not one of them was feeble. They were slaves. They had been beaten for years, but they all left. And the Bible says not one was feeble among them. Why? Because, the blood, that, because that lamb, when we take communion, we say, this is my body. This is his body that was broken for us. When they ate that lamb, it healed them. It brought them redemption. It gave them power to walk out into the desert. Are y'all with me? If, again, all these are pictures. Turn on over in your Bible. Look, well, you don't even have to look at the Bible. Let me just, I'll explain them to you. Do you remember this? When they were out in the wilderness, they went through the Red Sea, and they were shouting and dancing and rejoicing after they went through the Red Sea. It was parted, praise the Lord, and there's so many truths about that. Again, truths about, in fact, it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. It talked about how they went through, uh, went through uh, the Red Sea. And the Bible says they were baptized in the Red Sea. All those are pictures of new covenant promises. Well, you remember they got over and they were shouting and happy, but then they got mad. They said, hey, hey, hold on, what's going on? We're thirsty. We're thirsty. We ain't got any water. You mean you brought us out of Egypt, brought us through the Red Sea, and now we're dying of thirst. Moses, we can't stand you. You're the worst, blah, blah, blah. And they hated him. Do you remember? And then they came upon some water, and it was poison. The water was bitter. And do you remember the solution? Do you remember the, what the remedy was? God told Moses, take a limb off of a tree and throw it in the water, and it will cause the water to be sweet. It changed the bitter waters of Mara into sweet waters. I bet it tastes like 7-Up or Sprite. Come on, somebody. What is it a picture of? A picture of the tree. The, the, the tree is the cross. The Bible always calls, us, calls the cross a tree. When that, that, that tree touches bitter waters, it makes them sweet. It's the cross that causes everything in you and our, our life. It's what happened at that cross will turn around the bitterness of sickness, the bitterness of poison, the bitterness of whatever is that you're facing in your life. Are y'all listening to me? Every story, every detail, and I don't know them all. I don't know them all. We're going to look at, deeper into them. But you remember this? The manna from heaven. A few days later in the wilderness, now they're fussing and hungry. Yeah, now we, we, we drank some we drank some water, but now we're hungry. Moses, you brought us out here. Oh, we wish we could go back to Egypt. There we had leeks and onions. We had all this stuff. Forgot that they were slaves, but <laughs> are you with me? They started complaining and fussing at Moses. Oh, Moses, we can't stand you anymore. We're hungry. We're hungry. God didn't strike them down. Guess what he did? He didn't rain down fire from heaven. He rained down manna from heaven. He sent down manna. And if you read in the book of John, John chapter 6, Jesus says, your, your fathers ate manna in the wilderness. He said, and I'm that manna. I'm that manna. Again, it's a picture. It's a picture of sustenance. And the details, the details about it. Again, and my point today is just to show you, there's so many truths in the, in the, Old, Te the Old Testament is the new concealed. The new is the old revealed. The Old Testament the Old Testament truths are revealed in the New Covenant so we can see what, it, what he was talking about. They didn't know. They didn't know that they, when they were eating manna from heaven, they were eating Jesus. They didn't know that. It was sustaining them. But this manna from heaven that they complained about, do you all remember the story? They had to go out and get it every day. Whole chapter of details just about the manna falling from heaven. One chapter, one chapter in the beginning of the Bible about creation. Here's a whole chapter about the manna from heaven. Jesus talked about it in John chapter 6. Are you with me? Why so much detail? Because it's the details of the new covenant. And, uh, they had to go out and get that. There was instruction. It said, go and get it. Get as much as you want. Get as much as you want, but not too much 
so that you got to try to you have to go out and get it every day remember the whole point was get it every day get it every day and of course the children of israel ignored that they they didn't trust god so they thought well i better go get enough for tomorrow and the next day and the bible said whenever they gathered more than enough it would stink it would spoil but if they just went out and got enough and it says as much as everyone got was just enough for them if one person went out and they were real slow guess what god somehow miraculously made what they got enough for them and their family what god is saying if you'll just come and get me on a daily basis I'll make sure that all your needs are met for what you need. And this is why Jesus said that that the word of God is this manna, this daily bread. We as believers need that daily bread. And that's why I encourage you to join me every single day. Every single day, 7 a.m., Monday through Friday, I'm on Facebook Live with Prayer and Proverbs. Every Saturday morning at 8 a.m., just for half an hour. Why? To get that manna from heaven. To get the wisdom of God on a daily basis every day so that we can get this sustenance god will take care of you when you go and just seek him on a daily basis that fellowship that's what the man of heaven is all about of course story it's it's it, it explains so many details the manna from heaven was the longest miracle that that is ever recorded miracles are temporary but that's the longest miracle it lasted for 40 years but as soon as they got into the promised land as soon as they crossed the jordan guess what the manna stopped there were many there was a generation there that had never eaten anything else they had never lived off of anything else those that were born the young ones that were born that made it through the wilderness they were young they were remember because all the people that were 20 years and older they didn't make it it was just young people that made it they had eaten there were some babies that were born that had eat, never eaten anything but manna they had lived off of god's miraculous sustenance and so when they got to the place, to the promised land that God had promised them. As soon as their foot touched this, the sword, the Bible says that the manna stopped. The manna stopped that next morning. Why? Now God had brought them to their promised land and that miracle stopped. Miracles aren't to last forever. There's so many truths in there. And again, we want to get these truths and extract them so we understand how to live under the new covenant. How about this? Y'all remember this story? The people of God are getting hungry out in the wilderness and Moses strikes the rock with his staff for water. You remember that? And it was good. Water came gushing out. It came gushing out like a river. And God had told him to do it. And that first striking of the rock, again, remember what happened? God told him to go strike the rock with his staff. His staff. And, and of course, what that all represents is that staff. Remember that staff that he threw down, turned into a snake? It's the curse striking the rock. Jesus is the rock. He took the curse for us. And because he took the curse, we get the rivers of living water. And they lived out that water. It gave them sustenance. It was gushing. It was like a river that came out of there that, made, that provided for them because of the curse that went on Jesus. Y'all get what I'm saying? But remember what happened the next time. That's a picture of the cross. But the next time, remember, it was a boulder. If you read it in the, in the Hebrew, look at the words. It didn't say a rock that time. It said a huge rock, a boulder first time it was a rock jesus died in the flesh but the second time it says they came to a boulder and this time moses wasn't supposed to strike the boulder but he was supposed to do what he was supposed to speak to the boulder why because after he's gone to the cross the, the work is finished now now you just make declarations now you speak by faith and again these are all pictures of the new covenant but what did moses do moses got mad at the people because they were knuckleheads come on somebody and they were fussing and complaining about Moses and said man man oh man must I get water out of this rock if you read it closely he got all in pride and because he got all in pride he said must I get water out of this rock for you all you stiff necked people and he was you know just Christian cussing the people he was so angry at him and he struck the rock again how many of you know that Jesus only needs to go to the cross once and because he did that he lost his inheritance he he showed himself he showed he, in a prideful arrogant way he was trying to act he acted in his in his anger in his passion his anger I, I, I get it he was angry and passionate about it but he struck the boulder when god said no no don't do that don't show out just speak to it now he struck it god didn't punish the people god still brought water out of the rock all new covenant truths all new covenant truths but but 
Moses didn't get to make it into the promised land. Is he in heaven? Yes, we saw that at the Mount's Transfiguration. God didn't keep him out of, the, uh, out of heaven, but naturally out of the promises of God. And likewise, as leaders, as pastors, if we don't walk in, if we walk before the people in a, in a way that doesn't give honor and glory to God, doing what God says, we won't walk out with all that God has for us as well. And so these are all truths in the new covenant. Here's, a, here's the last one I'm going to give, and then we're going to close. But y'all see it, the whole the children of Israel's trek, all the details in the Old Testament, I mean from, and, and this week I got ready to share with you the, in Galatians chapter 4 about Sarah and Hagar, how the Bible says these two girls are the two covenants, the old covenant versus the new covenant. But I just wanted to show you that this week before we get to that next week. But look at this last story and we're, we're going to close. Look over in Numbers chapter 21, verse uh, 5 through 9. Numbers chapter 21 Y'all remember this story? Let's just read it so you can see this. And the people spoke against Moses and uh, spoke against God and against Moses. If you read the earlier verses, it says that the children of Israel, uh, they began to get wearied. Here they are in the wilderness. They're out there for many years. This is towards the end of their trek, towards the end of the 40 years. And they're getting weary. They're getting tired. It's like, you know, we're, we're tired. They started complaining about the manna. They started complaining about God. Look at it, it says, and the people spoke against God and against Moses. Look what they said. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the water? Did God bring them out to kill them? Of course not. Of course not. He brought them out to bring them in the wilderness to show that he was the one that was going to provide for them. Even though they got all the Egyptians' gold, he brought them out in the wilderness where they couldn't spend it. Why did he give them money but that, that they couldn't spend, where there were no malls? Why? To show them that your money isn't what provides for you. I'm providing for you. Again, all these are truths. Many people look to their money, but they don't look to God. Amen. And so he's showing us truths here. So he says, why have you brought us, uh, did you, why did you brought us, why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there's no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. What? How dangerous is that? That's real, though. That's real for even what, what, what many believers are facing today. Get tired of eating the word of God. Get tired of getting daily bread. I'm tired of that. I'm tired of getting up and going to church. I'm tired of watching you on, online, Pastor. I'm tired of that. I'm just, I'm just tired, of, I'm tired of all that. And that's where they were. They were going through a struggle in life, but they got tired of Jesus. They got tired of the Lord. Again, types and shadows, pictures of new, new covenant truths. He says, we're tired of this loathsome bread. Jesus said, I am that bread that manna from heaven so the lord sent fiery serpents if you read this this is called a uh, permissive tense in the hebrew and it wasn't that god sent the fiery serpents what he did was just simply remove himself and the fiery serpents were already out there in the desert come on somebody they were out there the 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 devil and the fiery serpents represent the devil so the lord sent fiery serpents among the people and they bit the people the devil is always represented in snakes. You know that as a serpent in the, in, the, in the wilderness, right? He says, so among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. Verse 7, therefore the people came to Moses and said, we've sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. You hear? So Moses prayed for the people. That's a good pastor right there. They've been running him down. They've been treating him wrong, running God down. And then he says, hey, they say, come and pray. Pray for us. And he prays for him. Look what he does. Then the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And it shall be that everyone who is bitten when he looks at it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole. And it was so. And, and so it was, if a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. What in the world is going on here? Again, these are all t- types and shadows of new covenant truths. So what's going on here? The, the, the children of Israel have gotten in rebellion. They're fussing and complaining about Jesus, who is the manna, okay? They're fussing about this provision that God's providing for them. They're tired of it. They're fussing and complaining. God... The the serpents represent the devil who starts killing them. As they get away from the word, they start dying. As they get away from the truths of eating the manna on a daily basis, they start dying. God tells Moses, get a bronze serpent. In the Bible, 
all the metals in the Old Testament, they all represent spiritual truths. Gold, gold in the Bible represents uh, righteousness and uh, divine righteousness and deity. That's why in the Holy of Holies, when you look at the tabernacle of Moses, back there are some articles that were made of gold. The, the ones that are in the holy place in the Holy of Holies are made of gold. The, the Ark of the Covenant was made of, of chittim wood, natural wood, and then outlined with gold. It was covered in gold, natural and deity. It's a picture of Jesus. Every detail, every detail in the Bible, even explaining the, uh, the, the cherubim, and we'll get into the details of the, of the tabernacle. I hope to. We'll see how we, how, if we get into these details. But, but in the outer, in the, in the court, I mean, the holy place, there was the, all the articles were made of gold, except in the outer court. Outside in the courtyard, the things were made of bronze. The, 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 the labor, where they'd clean their hands, where the sacrifice of the lamb was made. Bronze always represents judgment judgment silver represents redemption and the tabernacle the, the sockets were made of silver the wooden the wooden poles stood in silver sockets all these details represent new covenant truths are y'all listening to me so bronze serpent why a bronze serpent if this is whoever looked at this serpent bronze serpent on a pole whenever a snake would bite him he would live what does that mean that symbol, that serpent, is a picture of the curse. But I thought it should be a lamb on a, on a pole. Wasn't Jesus hung up? Jesus said it. He said, uh, if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all to me, is what it actually says in the Greek. I'll draw all what? Draw all judgment to myself. That's what that's representing. When Jesus was lifted up on the cross, he took all the judgment, that's what bronze represents, of the curse, the serpent. All the curse that the, that the serpent had for mankind, Jesus took it on him. And whoever looked at him, whoever beholds that he took the judgment for them, they would live. What is the Bible saying here under this new covenant truth? If you know that Jesus took your sickness, if you know that he took your judgment, if you know that he became poor that you could be rich, if you know that he paid the price for all of your sin, all of, all of your sin has been paid for by Jesus on the cross. You can't be killed by the serpent. Close your Bible. Good gracious Jesus. That's what the, the Old Testament reveals to us in the stories. The stories are pictures of truths about the new covenant. The more we understand those things, I didn't get to get to it today. My notes are too, too long to go into all the details, but maybe we'll pick up next week. The truth then is, P Peter said it, grace and peace. First Peter chapter First Peter chapter 1, or 2 Peter chapter 1, it says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you through the knowledge of him. In other words, grace increases to you the more you know who Jesus is and what he did for you on the cross. Friend, if you're watching today and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, can I assure you, God's not mad at you. He's madly in love with you, and he paid a great price for your salvation, for your healing, for your abundance. For you to walk in the peace that he's provided by receiving the chastisement that was due us. 